By the time Sotheby's called, begging me to come to Zurich, I'd reached equilibrium, a neutral point where days might elapse without my giving more than a passing thought to Hermann Weirich. Not that I'd expunged him by any stretch. he dominated every aspect of my life for so many years that part of him will always be with me, like a surgical scar, a slightly aching reminder of traumatic events best left undisturbed. But still, before they called, my life had changed enough where I had pretty much corralled Herman into a mental space that contained an after as well as a before. As the man who had discovered the little guy, I'll have my name linked with Herman's forever. I'm the eminence grease of Chicago's outsider art scene. Even after all these years, I still get invited to the Institute's symposia and seminars. There's always a stack of mail from people whose lives have been touched by Virex art. A large envelope and emails get forward to me from the Institute for Intuitive Art at least once a month. A lot of it I don't bother answering anymore. By now, there isn't a theory or opinion about Virex work that I haven't heard hashed to death. The tortured genius, the filthy pervert, the victim of institutional cruelty and bureaucratic neglect, mm -hmm. the psycho, idiot savant, rip-off artist, take your pick. It's enough to make me want to type F-U and hit reply all. Of course, Sotheby's didn't care what I felt about the poor bastard one way or the other. They'd scheduled a major auction of American outsiders and art brute from the best collection, assembling all the heavies, from Adolf Wolfe's religiously obsessed mandalas to the root sculptures of Bessie Harvey. But it's the poster boy for outsider art, my Virek, that they'd chosen for the catalog's cover. Now, a few weeks from the auction, some embarrassing questions had been raised about their Virek being a clever knockoff, and they were relying on my expertise to help them sort it out. My first inclination was to tell them no. First class plane ticket, deluxe hotel accommodations, an obscenely generous consultant's fee. It was obvious what they were up to. They wanted a hired gun to give them a free pass. I taught photography and industrial design at the Chicago Institute of Fine Art for 30 years, and of course I'm familiar with the landscape, but ordinarily I'm not the person you would pick to fly halfway around the world to vet a suspect Caravaggio or to do a thumbs up on a small Corro. I would never be called into court as an expert witness. No anxious family would nail its financial future on my passing judgment on their inherited painting, the one alleged to be a Goya. It was only the specific work in question that made my opinion worth Sotheby's extravagant investment in my comfort. If their piece was authentic, then undoubtedly I owned it over 25 years ago. The painting in question is not a painting in the truest sense, but a six-foot-long fold-out done with an unusual combination of cheap paint-box watercolor and collage, using images assembled from magazines, Sears catalogs, and comic books, and then glued to the underlying canvas. This work, if authentic, was created by a borderline lunatic named Herman Weirich, a reclusive hospital janitor who was a tenant of mine in an apartment building I once owned on Chicago's north side. When I first let his pieces go, I felt guilty asking a thousand dollars for them. Now Sotheby's estimate is five hundred times that, and the excited voice on the phone assured me it could go a lot higher. In the end, curiosity got the better of me. Who would try to duplicate Herman's iconic style, and could it be done well enough to fool me? Like a lot of iconic artists, Herman had a deceptive simplicity about his work. Stand in the Pollock Gallery at MoMA. I guarantee you'll hear someone say, what's the big deal? Give me a can of paint, and I'll knock one out. 
Mondrian, de Kooning, a lot of Warhol. Just give me a ruler and an obaque projector and stand back. I mean, it's true, as a draftsman, Herman was an untaught dauber who had to crib his figures from a Sears catalog. But there was a lot to his overall style, his manipulation and use of color, the childish bravado of the energy in his pieces that would be hard for someone to consciously duplicate. Then there was the voice on the other end of the phone. What American a male can resist the seductive lilt of a young woman with an English accent? All of us here at Sotheby's are positively enthralled with the piece you wrote about Virek for Anesthetica I used were a few years back. I'd love to talk to you about it. I tried to sound non-committal and unenthusiastic, but I agreed all the same. The tickets came by FedEx the next morning. I wondered if she'd stuffed them in the mail before she'd even picked up the phone. Unfortunately, I discounted the effect taking the trip would have on me. As the time of departure got closer, I slipped into a state of pre-fight anxiety that struck me as doubly disturbing because it was so out of character. Travel had always come second nature to me. I'd spent so many years as a freelance vagabond, my camera case stuffed with film, my battered Nikon loaded and ready, sleeping bag rolled, knapsack packed, all in the hall closet, just waiting for life or Nat Geo to give me the call. I'd gone to some pretty hot places and shot some pretty GD awful shit. But now, the thought of negotiating an unknown city, sleeping in a strange bed, or finding a bathroom in time filled me with disproportionate dread. What can I say? I, Nathan Lerner, have become an old man. My wife, Makiko, helped me pack. Of course, I asked if she wanted to come along. After all, it had been her idea to show Herman's work to the world, and she knew as much about the origins of it as anyone. If it had been up to me, Virek's famous trunk might have ended up in our basement with the rest of life's detritus. But Makiko turned me down. I think the thought of seeing his work going for so much money was too much for her to take. So I take the oh, taxi to O'Hare alone dressed in a sports jacket and a tie instead of my usual work shirt and 501s. It's an attempt to look age appropriate, something Makiko learned from a TV show she liked to watch. The ensemble is a mixed blessing. Walking across the vast space of the International Departures Terminal, respectively dressed with a first class boarding class and a wad of Swiss francs in my pocket, I feel the victim of an overly elaborate and misguided practical joke. I come through the outer door and the vast horizontal expanse of the airline terminal spreads out before me. It reminds me of one of Virek's mini murals, a low horizon space teeming with multi-hued battalions of amped up travelers locked in ragtag parade formation a Gandalinian war storm of marching men. By the time various attractive but vaguely disinterested Swiss Air staff guide me onto the plane, Herman's world, a world I thought I had exiled to a place distant from my own, begins to replay itself in my head. Sitting in first class, I watch the back of the plane fill up with tourists and college students. How old would Miriam be now if she were alive? Could she be magically sitting there in the back of the plane? Miriam, my ex, Tamar, Herman, and all the rest of them, our lives and stories entwined. They shut the door and the plane begins to undulate away from the gate. I look at my watch, six hours to Zurich. The plane turns onto the tarmac, and I get a glimpse of the old Sears Tower on the distant skyline. So much has changed since it was the tallest building in the world, and a little of it for the better, if you ask an old man. The stewardess comes down the aisle. She pays special attention to my seat belt. 
Does it really look as if I'd never been on a plane before? The pilot powers up the engines. The plane strains against the brakes, anxious to be off. I'm a passenger who pays attention to takeoffs and landings, no matter how many times I've been aloft. I believe that the uniqueness of flight should not be taken for granted. Yet, even as the plane imperceptibly leaves the ground and the rooftops and baseball fields of Chicago drop away below me, I can't enjoy the uniqueness of the perspective. The trip to Zurich has called me back to the beginning of my story and the end of Herman's.